welcome you all here this evening for our program on air safety. And uh, I'm pleased to turn this program over to our moderator of the evening, who will introduce the, our panelists. Our moderator this evening is Professor Joe Colt of the Kennedy School of Government. And uh, he will lead uh, this evening's discussion. As usual, we'll follow uh, the presentations with an opportunity for you to raise questions with our panelists. But again, thanks for joining us once again for another interesting program here at the uh, forum. Joe, if you will. Thank you. Well, we hope we have an interesting forum tonight. Uh, I've been asked uh, to both moderate and to provide some initial remarks. It turns out that I'm a member of something called the President's Aviation Safety Commission. Um, this is a commission created through the leadership of Senator Byrd and appointed by the White House designed to study the problems of aviation safety uh, due to report with some recommendations by next spring, recommendations largely built upon the kinds of things you will hear this evening from the participants in the industry on all sides of, of uh, the questions of aviation safety. I thought I'd try to provide some perspective by touching on some observations on what it seems to me are the real issues in aviation safety. And I'd like to begin with three observations that I, as a commissioner on this Aviation Safety Commission, see as relevant to tonight's discussion and to the broader issues of aviation safety. First of all, when we hold public hearings at our commissions and gentlemen such as these testify before us, when we ask directly whether the aviation system is safe, virtually everyone says, yes, the system is safe, but either that it could be safer or we need to keep it safe and that it may be in danger of losing something that's come to be called the margin of safety. Despite the rather salutary remark that the system is basically safe, according to the people we hear testimony from, at the same time, and my second observation, we're obviously in a time in which, at least among the general public, there is tremendous concern over the, over the safety of our aviation system. While everyone seems to, while the experts seem to agree that the system is basically safe, may need some work, everyone does agree that we should have the safest system, as pos safest system pos possible, but very few people agree as to how we should make the system safe. And I suspect we will hear more than a little disagreement tonight. As I see it and as we hear it, there seem to be four major areas where at least we face some choices. The answer in some of these areas may be to not change, but nevertheless, these are areas deserving of attention. And let me touch on these. First of all, what has been the impact of airline deregulation on the safety of the system? If uh, we were, we were real, Will Rogers and we believed only what we read in the newspaper, uh, we would rightfully be petrified to fly. Newsweek magazine has characterized 1987 as the year of the near miss. USA Today, in August, noted that, quote, the specter of mid-air collisions hangs as heavy as smog over the Los Angeles basin. USA Today, also in August, asks, is flying really safe or had passengers just been lucky until Sunday, referring to the tragic crash in Detroit? Mounting evidence, according to USA Today, suggests that it's just been luck by which we have avoided uh, tragedies. The problem with the uh, public perception in aviation safety is that to some extent these views are hard to reconcile with some of the evidence from recent years. Over the fast, past 15 years, only about 5% of the domestic, scheduled, domestic accidents among scheduled carriers have, have occurred as a result of errors by air traffic controllers. Over the past 15 years, only about 3% of airline accidents have involved general, general aviation aircraft. Since deregulation, major jet carriers' rates of accidents have been cut by more than one half, comparing 1970 through 78 to the period of 1979 through 85. We hear a lot of talk about uh, maintenance shortcuts. In the period since deregulation, equipment failure rates have been cut to approximately one-third of their, of their rates over the 1970 to 78 period. 
We hear about inexperienced or, or low uh, pilots receiving low pay. But pilots' errors now appear uh, in the post-1978 period to be less than one-half of what they were in the previous period. We hear that the PATCO strike and the firing of air traffic controllers may have harmed aviation safety. And yet accidents attributable, attributable to the air traffic control system appear to also be less than one-half of what they were in the period prior to 1978. In short, it's hard to conclude from the raw evidence that the period since 1978 and increased competition has led to a deterioration of aviation safety. And yet it is clear that deregulation has imposed some strains on the system. Lower fares, and especially discount fares, coupled with a generally strong economy in the last five years, has dramatically increased traffic. New entry and exit freedoms for carriers have put into place new patterns of service. But as we look to the steps that must be taken to keep pace with these increasing demands on the aviation system, the important thing is that we have to match the solutions to the problems. Personally, I find it hard to see how retreating to a world of protected monopolies represents a first best approach to trying to produce safety. What are the real questions that, lie, that need to be asked? Where do the solutions lie? Let me just touch on a couple of areas that I hope our speakers will address. One is the area of the Aviation Trust Fund. <clears throat> Through a series of user fees and other collections, there is an Aviation Trust Fund designed to provide for the funding of capital development and to some extent operations of the Federal Aviation Administration. Well, what's the issue with respect to the Aviation Trust Fund? which at present has approximately $5.6 billion in uncommitted balance, we hear that we need to take the trust fund off budget or that we need to allow the trust fund to be used to cover more of FAA operations or that we need to free trust fund monies and commit the uncommitted balance. It seems to me that the real issue with respect to the Aviation, aviation Trust Fund is whether the fund should be treated as a user fee, in which case it should be allowed to cover FAA operations, or whether it should be a capital development fee, in which case operations of the FAA, as distinct from the capital budget, should be covered out of general government revenues. A second major area after the trust fund needing attention, in, in a, on which we have taken considerable testimony, is the area of airports. Many have argued that airport capacity has not kept pace with the growth and demand for air travel. Indeed, the nation has not built a major new airport since the Fort Myers, Florida airport was finished in 1983. Also, it is true that we have not added uh, very many new runways at major airports, although there have some been, improve been some improvements in taxiways and exit ramps. If we do need more airport capacity, is the solution to force the FAA to, sp to spend trust fund monies? If so, how should the money be allocated? Who shall decide? Who will pick the bottlenecks that need debottlenecking? What role should local financing play in airport development? Many large communities have the capability to finance most or all of their needed airport capacity, and yet it's difficult to tell the citizens of Atlanta to pay for an airport when over 60% of the people passing through that airport are not citizens of Atlanta. At the heart of the question of airport capacity is the question of whether we need more capacity or whether we need to utilize existing capacity more effectively. At present, there are a number of environmental, noise, regulatory, and other sorts of objections that rightly or wrongly are raised as uh, impediments to the use of existing air airport capacity. For example, right at the present time, we still have restrictions on wide-body aircraft going into National Airport in Washington, originally designed as a mechanism of, purporting, of promoting Dulles Airport. Uh, that justification appears to have... Uh, uh, been eliminated. Can we use existing capacity more effectively? The last major area I'd like to touch on is the area of general aviation. In the wake of the tragic collision between a Piper and a DC-9 over Cerritos, California, and the reported increase in the number of near misses, there's been increasing attention, attention focused on the potential problems of mixing general aviation and commercial airline aircraft in congested airspace. The most common question that is asked is should, aircraft, should general aviation aircraft be required to uh, utilize mode C transponders? We don't dream of letting an automobile drive on an interstate highway at night without headlights, so it's hard to understand the argument for allowing an aircraft into congested airspace without a mode C transponder. Yet at the same time, it's hard to see any improvement in safety from requiring a mode C transponder 
on a crop duster in North Dakota? Where do you draw the line? A difficult problem. How can we safely accommodate the mix of general aviation and airline aircraft, and how should we allocate airspace and airport capacity among competing uses? General aviation, which is often thought of as a small pilot, in fact, accounts for nearly three-quarters of all the total hours flown in the United States, nearly half of all aircraft miles, over 80 percent of departures, and nearly one-quarter of all aircraft passengers. And yet the general aviation contributes only 3.3 percent of the trust fund monies. How should we allocate the costs across general aviation and commercial aviation? Well, these are some of the issues that need to be addressed in improving and maintaining our levels of aviation safety. I'd like to end by noting that we face some hard choices and often technical choices that lack glamour. The choices are usually not so easy as simply hiring another several thousand air traffic controllers or banning general aviation aircraft from uh, major airports or retreating to a world of monopoly regulation. Rather, the choices, as I note, are often technical. They often require more than political demagoguery. If the debate is not focused on the actual choices that need to be, de need to be made, demagoguery will prevail and ultimately the public and the aviation safety system will suffer. Well, with those remarks and that brief introduction to the kinds of issues that are being addressed by uh, the speakers that you'll hear tonight, let me introduce the speakers and first begin with Mr. Langhorn Bond. Mr. Bond is a former administrator from 1977 to 1981 of the Federal Aviation Administration. He really sat in the FAA and at its head during the early periods of the transition into a deregulated world. Mr. Bond, prior to being uh, the FAA administrator, was the Secretary of Transportation for the State of Illinois from 1973 to 1977. He is the son of an airline executive, he is a, himself a pilot, and he's an active aviation attorney. And he comes to us eminently qualified uh, to address the questions of aviation safety. Mr. Bond. I've been in this business long enough to know that an introduction like that usually leads into a hanging party. Uh, and I'm prepared for that. Thornburg's paying me my ticket up here, so it certainly seems only fair. I started out to be the introduction to this session, to try to set the scene a little bit historically. I'd like to uh, compliment Mr. Colt for doing a very good job on that indeed. I hope that you didn't miss uh, uh, what he said. It was, it was most interesting. He's obviously heard the story before on the President's Commission. Um, I'm going to begin with the word paradox, and I'd like to end with it, because to understand the problem of aviation safety, you can immerse yourself in a myriad of little details, which came already flowing out at you today, and you may miss the big picture. Um, I'd like to try and focus this large picture in philosophical terms. I, I put down the paradox, the word paradox, and I like it. Um, a couple of images. Uh, several years ago, the final issue of Time magazine showed a picture on the cover of an airline passenger flying through space, gripping his seat in sheer terror at the prospect of going along in an aircraft. Death lurked everywhere. This was the last issue of the year in which there was not a single fatality in the United States on U.S. registered uh, airliner heavy jet aircraft during the entire calendar year. Another perfect year. How can it be, say I and many others in this industry, that we've just knocked off another perfect year and the picture is on the cover of Time magazine? Why is it so good? And everybody says, it's so bad. Maybe this is a useful thing to address. The term paradox, uh, I was th it brought me back to Zeno's paradox. Do you remember that? It, just sitting here. Uh, it goes like this. You take a distance from A to B and you cut it in half and then you cut the remaining part in half and then you subdivide that infinitely. And the paradox, as I recall it from my philosophical days at university, was that you never reach the end, even though you make infinite 
almost infinite progress towards the, towards the goal. That's kind of what it is in aviation safety. The little bit that's left is so small that you can har hardly see it. Admittedly, it's never entirely gone. People don't seem to recognize how far we've gone, and that's the paradox. I'll refer to that at the end of the day, uh, and I feel particularly uh, free to talk in this way because here at the university uh, setting, all university settings, the notion of cost-benefit, priorities, health, the protection of human life, the regulatory structure is very close to the surface as a major discipline is subject to study and analysis here at these universities. And uh, one of the things that you all might conclude at the conclusion of this panel is A, that there's a great deal of discussion uh, of this subject, but B, as a public health issue, it ranks uh, to 125th, for example, of the size of wearing a helmet when you ride a motorcycle. That's the relative safety risk there is in scheduled air transport. Mr. Colt has touched on this briefly, but let me just remind you of what he said. Um, the, the, the curve of life loss, which was very high relative to usage in air transport in the very early days, has plunged so precipitously in, in the sense of rate per, per accident over the years that it is one of the most dramatic successes in, a, in American life. Of all the things that you can look across in our spectrum of things that the government does and the private sector does, and that people buy the services at uh, some degree of risk, hardly anything that you can look at today uh, is as successful as the story of, a, of the cooperation between the government and the unions and the private sector in civil air transport. The one statistic that you ought to just look at is this. Everybody said when deregulation comes along and they don't have to, uh, you know, the rates and they're going to cut salaries and they're going to chop maintenance to, to death because the free market will cause them. Boy, it's really going to be risky out there. I was the guy who went before the uh, Congress and said it's not going to uh, be a problem for us in the future. Don't worry about dereg. Oh, every corner, it's terrible death and destruction. Since that time, <clears throat> the fatality rate from a more reliable witness than I has halved in that decade prior decade to 1977, past decade, 50 percent reduction in the fatality rate in a free market. Now, there ought to be a lesson in that, and that is that things are getting a lot better. Compare the approximately, in talking about the loss of life in, in civil air transport, they, the, the deaths come in large bunches. They're large tragedies. They're sensational. But nonetheless, you've got to remember that there are 18,000 or so takeoffs in scheduled air transport each and every day, maybe a million and a half people every day go up in an airplane in scheduled air transport every day. And the loss of life over the course of a year is about, averaged out, about 100 fatalities over the course of a year. The number of people killed in a motorcycle accident in the United States, 2,500. 40,000 people killed in automobiles. That is a major public health hazard. If you want to tell your kid to do one thing that he could cause him to survive into his 20s, tell him to wear his seatbelt. That's a, that's a public health problem. And I have to, to say that my friend Ed Pinto here, who is a representative of the small plane pilots, has instructed me to say that 1,000 people choke to death each year in the United States. Presumably, if they are general aviation pilots, it's from steak. <laughs> All right. Why did it get so good in scheduled air transport? What has happened over the years? Have Public crusades has focus, has attention, done it. Have management or union pressures or the government's brilliance or the government's uh, inattention? What has caused it? I'd like to list a series of things that have happened that have caused it to be so very good and some of the things here in part three of my talk that will tell you what's coming in the future. Let's start with the jet engine. We all know that it's a simple rotating device. It replaced all those high-pressure, supercharged, turbocharged, reciprocating turboprop engines that would melt down. Jet engines are simple in concept, and they hardly ever fail. And if they do, the other one doesn't quit. And since you only need one in a two-engine airplane to fly, it goes just along fine. Reliability of power plants 
Tolerance of failure has eliminated largely the whole idea of catastrophic engine failure in air transport. That's one. Technology has done it. Uh, better and more stable aerodynamics. The planes are subject to a well-understood discipline today. They're terrific. Um, the jet plane itself, flying at 30 and 40,000 feet, avoiding bad weather, taking direct routings, that alone worth a lot in safety. Precision approaches, the instrument landing system, there are now 500, I believe, in the United States, land down to 200 feet, in some cases auto land, even in the worst weather and visibility. A wonderful device, widespread now throughout the United States, that's come on stream. Air traffic control radar. Starting in 1972, the FAA began to install radars which can see aircraft on uh, on, the, um, on their screen. Controllers watch it. They keep the aircraft pried apart. That has, as you will see later on, largely eliminated mid-air collisions, but it's done more than that. The radars are adjusted so that if an aircraft in a certain sector gets below the safe altitude, and the controller can tell what altitude the plane is at because of a transponder on board, an alarm goes off, uh, uh, to, and he tells the pilot that he's too low. Okay. That's a piece of technology that's come along. Airborne weather radar. Every jet plane that you're in out there has its own radar that profiles storms along the way and avoids them. Uh, that's a new piece of technology. Better and better airports. Longer runways, clear approaches. Those are coming on stream. They're crowded, as the reference was a little bit earlier, but they're still safe. Okay? Ground proximity warning systems. If a pilot gets too close to the ground, the radar altimeter goes off and says, pull up. That device alone, combined with the radar warning, has virtually eliminated the, the, the catastrophic crash that we used to see called CFIT, Controlled Flight into Terrain. Flight simulators. We don't do much training in aircraft anymore. The most horrible and dramatic kinds of failures in an aircraft, which we could not do for fear of crashing during training, are now routinely done with pilots in flight simulators. What is coming up for the future? I'm going to wind it up quick, moderator here. There are two particularly important pieces of technology along the way. One is a mid-air collision avoidance device uh, on board to tell pilots when they're about to have a conflicting course with another aircraft. Uh, that is a piece of technology that has yet to be invented, and that will continue to drive the mid-air collision threat uh, downward, although it is almost er eliminated already. Prior to 1972, we had an average of two mid-air collisions between air carrier aircraft per year since 1972, 15 years, we've had two with heavy jet aircraft. Two. That's not bad, and the, and the airborne collision avoidance device is going to make it even better, but don't think that it is a major hazard today. Finally, I want to talk about wind shear detection. That is a weather phenomenon that wasn't even f identified until 1978 by Dr. Fujita, but uh, we are now working on technology that will eliminate wind shear collision, wind shear devices, and that will allow the pilot to avoid wind shear as well. Those two things are coming along. Now, the paradox is, since everything is getting so much better, and since the technology is out there to help us all, why is there so much focus on all of this problem as if it were a major public health problem today? Uh, I don't know the answer to that other than that it is a sensational and interesting subject and that there are a lot of deep-seated fears in everybody's uh, psyche that worries about falling out of the sky in an airplane. All I can tell you is, statistically, it's not likely to happen, and it's going to get better and better in the years ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, our next speaker is Mr. Edmund Pinto. Mr. Pinto is the Senior Vice President for Communications of the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association. He himself is a former Assistant Administrator of the Federal Aviation Administration from 1981 through 1985. Prior to that, had a long background in journalism and work on uh, Capitol Hill. Mr. Pinto. Thank you, Joe. 
I agree with every, almost everything Langhorne says, and I think you're going to find out tonight that most of us up here who are in the business will be mostly in agreement. The skies are safe in the view of general aviation. The skies are inefficient, uneconomical. I live every day with the kind of with the kind of question Langhorne has raised. Why is it that if the skies are so safe and it's not a public health problem, there's this, there's this great uh, perception out there that the skies are falling? I don't know the answer either, but I, have, uh, I suspect a lot of it has to do, from my experience, uh, with the fact that we as a society, through our, our – I will talk news media, but that's primarily my, my uh, upbringing. We're, not, we're providing information to the general public that is essentially, in many instances, because of competitive pressures, because of uh, learning, because of uh, inexperience, because of misinformation, essentially not properly being disseminated. It's flawed information leading to perceptions, incorrect perceptions, and it grows upon itself. George Will wrote a column not too long ago in which he talked about the, uh, the great fears of the mid-air collision as something akin to uh, we're involved in a national hysteria, a national hysteria over this issue of, of mid-air collisions. Uh, there, was an, a, there was an executive of the Federal Aviation Administration in the Air Traffic Service who recently coined a phrase, I hadn't heard this one before, uh, the, the FAA breaks down near mid-air collisions as hazardous, maybe you can help me, Billy, I forget the three categories, but there were three categories, each one succeedingly uh, more serious. Uh, this, this gentleman coined the phrase political near mid-air collision report. That is, reports that are being generated for purposes other than aviation safety, but to gain some kind of attention and some kind of uh, uh, get the government or the media or Congress involved in other, in other areas. Case in point is a, is a situation, parallel runways at Los Angeles International, two planes cleared for landing. One of the planes declared a near miss. They both were under control of the controllers. Both were separated. Both were in no danger to one another. They were both were on, on the center line. And yet one of those pilots declared a, mi a near mid-air collision report. <clears throat> My, I find when I talk about uh, air safety, I tend to recall uh, an introduction that, I, uh, that was once given uh, to a dinner, about a dinner speaker who, and the MC said of this man, he made a million dollars in oil right here in California. When he got up to speak, this guy got up and said, that's essentially correct, but we need a few adjustments here. First, it was not oil, it was coal. It was not California, it was Pennsylvania. It was not a million dollars, just a few hundred thousand dollars. And it wasn't me, it was my brother, and he didn't make it, he lost it. Everything was close, but it wasn't there. In general aviation, we find ourselves with another burden to bear. Those of us often feel that we are like the jav in a javelin competition where you have to have a coin to us, and we flip the coin and we win the coin, we win the coin to us, and then we elect to receive. General aviation, according to the way we believe, is frequently being held up as the problem in air safety, as the reason for delays in, of the air carriers, as the cause of knocking down airliners from the skies. Uh, we seem to feel we carry the burden of the whole system on our shoulders. And yet, as has been pointed out previously, we have a remarkable safety record. All of aviation has a remarkable safety record. But in the case of general aviation for 27, nearly 27 consecutive years, the safety record has improved. And I venture to say that there hasn't been a, uh, there isn't a mode of transportation in the country, let alone, especially motor vehicle transportation. Langland, you were, you were low by, by about 8,000, the last figures I've seen on motor vehicle deaths. They had been going down from about 52,000 down to low 40s, and now they're on their way back up again, as are drunk driving deaths, and those, that's the national shame in this country. Um, there isn't a mode of transportation that can claim nearly 27 straight years of improving safety. And in the last 10 years, as the air carriers have improved dramatically, uh, deaths in general aviation also have been halved. It's just a remarkable uh, record, and, in, and instead of being castigated, uh, it's, to, it's to be applauded. It's a dramatic record. But it's not, but it's not happening, and, and the answers are very difficult to get why we're not finding uh, more of an acceptance of aviation as a, as a very safe way of uh,
travel in this United States. I'll, I'll stick strictly with the, with the uh, topic and, and mention a few things where uh, we believe we can do some, make some better fine-tuning improvements in the system. Just a couple to throw out to you for the sake of discussion later. Uh, we need to improve our air traffic system equipment. That will be of a tremendous help. We do have a modernization program going on, but that program, which was supposed to have been completed in 1995, has seen subsequent serious delays occur and will not be completed till the year 2002, if that schedule holds. Uh, the, uh, right, and it's an important program. Right now, the figures that I've I read somewhere lately, recently that the United States is the second largest purchaser of tube-type equipment in the entire world. That includes third world countries as well as industrialized countries. And within the United States, the Federal Aviation Administration is the number one purchaser of tube type equipment. That's the state of some of the equipment that we're, that we're asking our, our uh, professionals in air traffic to operate nowadays. We've all seen stories and, and heard stories of the difficulty in maintenance right now. The maintenance people, are, they're losing people because of attrition and retirements. New equipment's not coming on. The old equipment is breaking. It's getting very difficult in that area. We need the modernization very badly. We need the airport that goes, airports that goes without saying that. Joe had mentioned that. My association is in a push right now looking for some support for a national aviation policy. We don't have a national aviation policy. The so-called National Airspace System Plan is a blueprint for technology, but as a policy, we, we aren't sitting down as a nation saying, here's what we want in our aviation system 20 years from now, akin to the interstate highway system policy of the 1950s when, when the government and the people decided we were going to ring, extend uh, major highways across the nation. Uh, and then we built them, and in, several, in, in two decades we had that system. Uh, akin to John F. Kennedy's, we're going to be on the moon in 10 years a policy that sets the direction and sets the priorities, and we're not doing that right now. So we're trying to gain some attention in Washington for that effort. As a society, we're also looking in the wrong direction about where the problems are. Uh, we don't want to, we in general aviation don't want to hide the fact that there are near mid-air collisions reports and that we are frequently connected with those reports, but we do have most of the airplanes in the skies. Uh, on, uh, we can go into figures and statistics and percentages, and I could make a case that uh, w we're involved far less times in, uh, as a, on a percentage basis than, than we should be. But that's not really the point. The point is we have other activities we need to look at, and some of those were mentioned here uh, by Langhorn. Not too long ago, the users of aviation in Washington, of which uh, John O'Brien, uh, Alpa, was, his group was part of it, we all got together and we decided we needed to analyze the system and we needed to give our politicians and our political leaders, our transportation secretary, our FAA, FAA administration, administrator, uh, an idea of where we see the flaws in the system and what to do about them. And for the first time in the history, I think in the history of U.S. aviation, such diverse groups as the airline pilots, the airline management, uh, general aviation, we got together and we put aside our differences, and we have differences, and we concentrated on the 95% of, of the areas in which we, which we agree, and, and, and we came up with a document which we circulated through the Hill and all around the country, and it lists six major areas where we need improvements, uh, and um, the air, tra air traffic system capacity, airport capacity, not in the order of preference, national airspace system plan, the modernization needs to get going, aviation weather as the, as the most, as the single most important element in improving uh, accident, uh, improving uh, uh, safety and efficiency, collision avoidance systems, and air to ground communications. Those were the areas we, we didn't want to concentrate on the near mid air collision potential because it's such a rare occasion. Uh, and yet it is, it is the one that everybody seems to focus on. And while we focus and look at that potential hazard, we don't, we find ourselves not directing the national attention and the national will to the other areas that really caused the deaths. Uh, in the last six airline accidents, uh, including the Cerritos one, we've killed 700 people. Only Cerritos involved a, a general aviation plane or a mid-air collision. Only Cerritos. And that's the one that still continues to get the most attention. There were serious weather situations in, all, in many of the other ones. 
we're not really paying attention to them. Why? I'm not really sure. Uh, we've mentioned the fact of the um, we've mentioned the fact of the uh, numbers of deaths in in automobile accidents. Uh, we have a situation where not too recently a newspaper in, uh, in Pittsburgh, Governor Thornburg, won a Pulitzer Prize for uh, reporting on the issue of drunk pilots. There hasn't been an airline accident in the, in the United States, in my memory, that involved a member of the crew with alcohol or drug abuse in, 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 in his system. In general aviation, to our discredit, but really to our credit also, maybe as many as 40 people, 40 people a year may be killed because of some alcohol involvement, and that comes down to a few percentage points of the full accident total. And yet, the 55% of deaths related on the highway to, uh, or to uh, alcoholism goes untreated in this country. Harvard University, I just read, through a School of Public Health, is about to engage in a program that the government should be engaging in to try to cut into the deaths of, uh, in automobiles uh, because of alcohol problems. I just have a note in front of me that says I've got two minutes, and I, and, uh, and I guess I better uh, uh, live by that because I've got also three other, three other gentlemen who are waiting their turn also to, to get here. The message I'd like to just leave with you is society, most of our society is looking in the wrong direction when it comes to the debate on air safety. We're really ignoring the problems that we are having today and we will be having tomorrow because we are caught up in what George Will has said, this national hysteria over what is essentially the rarest of all kinds of uh, aviation accidents. We're ignoring the problems, and if we continue to, to ignore the problems, we're never going to have the national will or set the national priorities to solve them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ed. Well, our next speaker is Mr. John O'Brien. John is the uh, director of the Engineering and Air Safety Department of the Airline Pilots Association. He has been 15 years with the ALPA. Prior to that, he spent seven years at Pan Am, two years as a pilot himself, and five years in its space development programs. John? Thank you and good evening. I'm going to disagree a little with uh, previous two speakers with regards to safety, margins of safety, exposure to risk. Before I disagree, let me say that from the Airline Pilots Association's perspective, the system is safe. But what concerns us involves our definition of safety. And our definition of safety involves exposure to risk. And one of the ways we look at exposure to risk is incidents. Accidents are not in a good indicator of safety levels. Incidents, we feel, are a much better level or indicator. Some people have inferred that um, the mid-air collision problem is not a, a serious problem, and we really shouldn't be focusing on that. And basically we are because of a lot of media hype. But newspapers have to make a profit, and they make that profit by printing what people like to read about. And people like to read about things primarily because they're interested in them, and they're interested in them when they affect them personally. More people fly now than ever before. There are more near mid-air collisions now than ever before. Does that make it unsafe to fly? No. Nope. But it should be cause for concern, and it is, and that's why we have a technological program to develop a collision avoidance system for all air carriers. And Piedmont Airlines just recently announced that they will equip their entire fleet within three years. And that's good. They have been a pace setter in this area. And people have mentioned, previous speakers have mentioned, programs the FAA has underway, new computers, new hardware, 
special software programs in existing old computers to reduce the collision risk. I won't bore you with the technical details, but there's a lot of effort being expanded on existing hardware to try to get the most out of it. And it certainly isn't because there's no problem or there's no exposure to risk. Obviously, we wouldn't be spending millions and millions of dollars addressing collision avoidance systems for airplanes, developing software to fit in old, outdated hardware, because there is a problem today. But the problem is being attacked through technology. And as Mr. Bond indicated, technology has made the industry safer, whether it's a ground proximity warning system or a collision avoidance system to be implemented or some software in an air traffic control computer. Those are the things that have reduced the fatalities over the past 10 years. Not a free enterprise system. It's been technology. The free enterprise system deregulation, we believe, has increased exposure to risk. But it's not just deregulation. It's the economic conditions that occurred simultaneous with the implementation of deregulation. It was, indeed, the controller strike, which occurred at the same period of time. It also, and most importantly, is part of our government's deficit reduction program, which has been occurring for some time is occurring at a very fast pace, we hope now. All of these things, we feel, have contributed to an increased exposure to risk. And let me just tick off a few examples for you. Deregulation started officially in 1978, and there were a lot of doom and gloom forecasts about the competitive environment, financial cost cutting, rapid expansion, FAA's inability to keep up. We were one of those who voiced such doom and gloom. However, a couple of things conspired to negate those immediate effects. One was a mini recession we were going through in the late 70s, early 80s. There wasn't that demand or that much demand for airline service, whether it was business or private entertainment type pleasure, or entertainment travel, vacations, whatnot. Fuel costs were up, significantly up. I think you remember the late 70s, fuel costs, early 80s. And then the controller strike, 81, which caused the FAA to restrict the number of airplanes that could operate in the system. All these things conspired to put a roadblock in the way of deregulation and its real impact on, this, on the industry. But they also conspired to reduce the number of airplanes, at least airline airplanes flying in the system, and that had an immediate impact on the fatalities, less exposure to risk. If you look at the accident rates and the fatalities, you can see a significant downturn early in the deregulated environment. And it really wasn't until 1985 that you saw a terrible turnaround. In fact, one of the worst years ever as far as fatalities. Well, what happened? 1984, all of the restrictions were taken off the air traffic control system. We tried to return to normal. The FAA claimed the system was ready to go again at full force. The recession went away. Economics turned around so that industry was really ready to go. There was a demand for service. Fuel costs were down. So we had a tremendous explosion in growth. And what was the first thing we saw? Delays, increased near misses, operational errors, pilot deviations. The system was overtaxed. And what do we see on top of that? We saw an inability on the part of the FAA to follow its basic charter. It did not have the resources to adequately inspect and enforce regulations. That's why you see things like what is happening during the past few years and today on Eastern Airlines. 60,000 violations of regulations against one airline, millions of dollars in fines. That didn't happen overnight. It took years for that to develop. Where was the FAA when that was developing? 
the FAA actually had its resources reduced during this time period. And it wasn't until the rapid expansion, 82, 83, 84, that those weaknesses showed up in the system. And if you go back and look at the manning and personnel levels and the budgetary commitments to the FAA during this time period, you see very, in our opinion, drastic reductions. So how could you expect the FAA, the agency charged with inspecting and enforcing and maintaining safety standards, to do its job? It was impossible. So what's the solution for all of this? Well, many of the things we see, whether it's new technology, uh, financial conditions on the carriers, commitment of resources to the FAA to be able to do its job, all are economic in nature. And because of that, and this isn't something new, it was known years and years ago when the Aviation Trust Fund was developed. The Congress and the industry and its wisdom some time ago developed an Aviation Trust Fund so that there would be a resource to draw upon to implement new technologies, new hardware, provide resources. This Aviation Trust Fund is working. There's a surplus. You heard five to six billion dollars in uncommitted funds. If you ask the U.S. Treasury Department, there's over nine billion dollars surplus in the Aviation Trust Fund. Why isn't it being spent? It's not being spent because back during the Johnson administration, one of his last acts in office was to take Aviation Trust Fund, Highway, Social Security, all of those special purpose things, put them in the general fund so that balance, the budget could be balanced. And it was balanced. When he left office, it was balanced. It's the last time it's been balanced. But it was balanced through a legislative maneuver, administrative maneuver. But because of that activity, Every dollar that's spent when you buy an airline ticket now, 6% of it, or 8% of it, excuse me, is supposed to go into this aviation trust fund. Well, it does on paper, but the hard cash dollars goes into general revenue and may get spent on health, education, welfare, Department of Defense, energy. It could be spent on a lot of different things. So on paper, there's a $9 billion surplus, but in real hard dollars, there's not a dollar there. So if we were to increase spending for aviation and do all these things that need to be done, two very bad things would happen. One, the deficit would increase. We don't want that to happen. Or some other government program would have to be cut. And there's a fierce competition within Congress for funds these days. So we're not going to get them in aviation because it is so safe. In fact, when OMB was asked, why don't you allocate more funds to the FAA, one of the staffers over there was quoted in saying, we kill more people in off-road accidents per week than you do in aviation in a year. So how do you expect us to give more money to aviation? Thank you, John. Well, John asked, where is the FAA? And part of it is here tonight. Uh, Billy Meyer, speaker as an area air traffic control supervisor for the Federal Aviation Administration in the southwest region uh, out of Lubbock, Texas. He's worked his way up th through the ranks of the air traffic control system, knows it intimately, spent 20 years in somewhere involved in the air traffic He himself is a pilot and an aviation safety counselor. Billy? Thank you, and I hope that you picked up on something that Joe said at the very beginning because he made a very important statement, and that is that the system is safe and we need to keep it that way. I'm going to try to address that a little bit this evening. How safe are you when traveling by air? You're safer than if you were at home doing many of your regular chores. There is an element of risk in any mode of transportation, but air travel is far and away the safest. You may be in an accident someday, but it's hardly even possible that it'll be in an airplane. When you're traveling by air, there are hundreds of people out there looking after you. Some of those people are air traffic controllers like myself. We are often frustrated because what we do is so complex that it's almost impossible to explain. We are especially frustrated every time there's an aircraft accident because the misconceptions about our part in the air safety system seem to rise to the surface all over again. 
still embedded in people's minds is what they heard from the Patco strikers in 1981. They forget that that was a group carrying to extremes a few legitimate and a lot of illegitimate gripes which stressed over and over again every, th every bad thing they could think about, the air traffic control system, and the media listened. People forget that the rest of us quietly kept things going in some rather incredible conditions. We were too busy to talk to the media, and the few that did often did a terrible job of explaining. My frustration level finally reached the point that I decided to give it a try. The views that I present here tonight are my own and are not necessarily those of the FAA or even all air traffic controllers. I'm here with years of experience trying to correct some of the misconceptions about air traffic control and air safety. Misconception number one, air traffic controllers are a bunch of jittery, nervous wrecks. This is a misconception. Most of us love what we do. It's fun. There's no other job like it. It's far from easy, and sometimes it takes us a while to relax after a busy shift. But people who manage to become controllers are good at it mainly because their minds work a certain way. Only one of every 250 people who attempt air traffic controller training comes out a full-fledged controller. The training is rigorous, and even on the job, we are constantly checked. Every word that we say or that is said to us is recorded. Think about your own job. How well would you come out if every word you said on the job every day was broadcast for all the world to hear? Misconception number two. All airplanes are in contract with, contact with air traffic control, getting instructions from air traffic control, and doing exactly what the controller tells them to do. This is a misconception. Pilots are required to talk to air traffic control only when they're flying in certain areas or using certain airports. There's a lot of airspace up there where they can fly and never talk to a controller on the ground. This is perfectly legal and it's almost always safe, but here's where a lot of the problems happen. We can often see these airplanes on our radar scopes, but we can't always tell what altitude they're flying. We will tell the pilots we're talking to when one of these aircraft come into their area, and when we suspect two airplanes are on a collision course, we will tell the one that we're talking to about it and offer him a course or altitude change, but it's up to the pilot to decide what to do. Misconception number three, when two planes collide, a controller let it happen. That is a misconception. I wish that we could wrap every airplane in a pocket of perfectly clear, clear, empty, smooth air when it takes off and guarantee that nothing could happen to that plane until it's on the ground again. That's what people expect when they fly, but we can't do that. What we can do is provide a safe corridor for the pilot to fly in, furnish every bit of information we have to the pilot so that he or she can handle whatever comes up. Misconception number four, a controller let that plane land in a thunderstorm. That is a misconception. We tell the pilots where the main storm areas are, what turbulence or other weather activity other pilots have reported, if there's rain, fog, snow, and how good they're going to be able to see when they near the ground. But when we say clear to land, it means only that there are no other planes in front of them. The pilot has to watch the weather and decide which conditions he or she is competent enough to handle. Misconception number five, if we had more controllers, we wouldn't have so many delays. This is a misconception. If we had one controller for each airplane, they still could not all take off in the land at the same time. There's only so much runway and so much empty air. I've walked through airports and seen as many as six airplanes on each airline schedule board scheduled to take off in the same minute. Anyone can see that's an impossibility and builds in delays. But don't totally blame the airlines either. Passengers pay for convenience, and airlines offer flight time that people want. But it's like Boston or Dallas streets. At 3 a.m., you can drive anywhere you want with no delay. At 5 p.m., you jam up with everyone else and take your turn. And barring any alcohol factor, at 3 a.m., you're not likely to be involved in an accident. At 5 p.m., the risk is very much greater. Misconception number six, we need to hire the PATCO controllers back then there would be enough to experience controllers. That is a terrible misconception. We lost some good controllers in the strike of 81, but they had fair warning and fair treatment. The president and those of us dedicated to our responsibility did not let them bring this country to its knees as they vowed. The air traffic system had to be altered at the time, but it turned out to be a better, safer system. We now have a large number of young can-do controllers, and let me tell you, air traffic control is a young person's job. To a large extent, those controllers hired since the strike 
have more experience than many of those who walked off the job. And since the career span of an air traffic controller in terms of years is limited, most of the fired controllers have now passed their prime. They would all have to retrain, learn the new system, would stall the new group's career advancement, break the government financially in retroactive wages and training costs. Training costs alone are estimated at $177 million. Rehiring them would also bring about mass retirement of those of us with the experience and who kept things going during the strike. We are also about through our careers and will not work with the strikers. You cannot imagine the animosity that they stirred up for several years before the strike and the added pressure that they put on us. Controllers must work closely with and trust each other implicitly to be able to do their part of the job. The PACO group went to great lengths to create an atmosphere of mistrust and tension before the strike, and that behavior could very well continue if they returned. The resulting tension could easily create labor and safety problems that have not existed since the strike. We cannot possibly trust these people ever again. We would consider rehiring them a betrayal of our effort and sense of duty. I look at air safety from several viewpoints. I am an air traffic controller, was for many years a pilot and aircraft owner. I and my loved ones fly on commercial planes as passengers, and I occasionally ride the jump seat in the cockpit of commercial planes to keep in touch with what the airline crews cope with and look for ways to Im improve our service to them. Here are some of my observations. I feel safe with the system. The only time I do not feel secure is when flying in bad weather. We can do nothing about bad weather except to try and avoid it. In an airplane, it can scare you to death. So the next time your flight is grounded because of weather, be happy that the pilot doesn't want to fly through it. Believe me, you don't want to go through it if he doesn't. There are wide variations in pilot competence. Pilots who know what they're doing are very careful. After all, as one commercial pilot told me, if his aircraft is involved in an accident, he's going to be the first one to arrive at the scene. However, c controllers see pilots who are at the controls for the very first time and salty old captains with thousands of hours. No offense, John. <coughs> commercial pilots and most military pilots are a joy to work with. They are professionals and most cooperative. Private, many private pilots also command our respect, but there are some who have been badly trained and have no idea that they're bad pilots, not necessarily in their ability to handle the airplane, but in knowing the rules and the system. Another observation, the sky must eventually be divided into areas for slow planes and areas for fast planes. Small plane pilots don't want to hear this, but the days of zooming off into the wild blue yonder anywhere, anytime are coming to an end. We didn't have a problem with this until Wilbur said to Orville, let's build another one. There are just too many using the airspace for that anymore. Some airports are also going to have to be segregated, some for the larger planes and some for the smaller planes. The public must decide between convenience or economy. Convenience means more taxes to finance more airports and personnel so more pl planes can take off and land at the more convenient times. To avoid the expense of building more airports, passengers and airlines must settle for more spread out flight schedules. Before 1981, the FAA centers had recorded only one day in which there were more than 100,000 air traffic operations. In 1986, there were 164 days with more than 100,000 operations, and forecasts for the next 10 years indicate that commercial carrier fleets will increase by 1,000 airplanes. And finally, if, if angels did all the flying, we could have a 100% safety rate. Since humans do it too, there will be accidents. The public has to accept that just as we accept and expect automobile accidents. The number one cause of airplane accidents is pilot error. A large number of pilot error accidents involve flying into bad weather, but there's seldom only one cause to an airplane accident. Human error, bad judgment, equipment breakdown, or just plain bad luck. Things that happen separately all the time may occur all at once. When that happens, aircraft and human lives are usually lost. It becomes even more important for each segment of the aviation community, the airlines, general aviation, and the military to continue doing the very best possible job they can. In the air traffic control field, our job simply stated is to provide a safe, orderly, and expeditious flow of air traffic. We too must look con continue to look toward system improvement and continually do our best to improve the system. 
To conclude, let me quote something I read recently. We will change the way we have done business, not because the past has not been good enough, but because the future must be better. We owe it to the people who in the next century will depend upon the system that we develop in this one. Thank you. Thank you very much, Billy. Our last speaker is John, John Gallipo. John heads up something called the Aviation Safety Institute, a nonprofit arms length institute whose main work has consisted, consisted of developing a highly successful hazard reporting system. John has taught aviation engineering at Ohio State University. He's a member of the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association. He's also a member of the Society of Experimental Test Pilots. John. Thank you, Joe. It's an honor to be here tonight. It's also unusual, or not unusual, it is, uh, I should say, a, my position to bat uh, cleanup. While I generally agree with most of the statements that were made this evening, uh, I'm delighted that this is not a debate because I would have several issues to debate. I would agree with John O'Brien's definition of safety uh, I would extend it one step further by Mr. Webster. It is the absence of danger or risk. In some cases, there are people in the aviation industry who define safety as that which keeps them from doing what they're going to do anyway. And uh, I have plenty of examples of that. I can't give those to you tonight, obviously. The Aviation Safety is Institute is something. It is a nonprofit organization dedicated to aggressive accident prevention. And the, our activity, as John O'Brien pointed out, uh, his reference to incidents, uh, we spend all of our time devoted to searching for incidents so that we can break out of it the unsafe condition and the unsafe act and try to find out if there is a linkage that can be put with an unsafe act and an unsafe condition or various combinations. If we can define that linkage, we can find a way to cut the linkage. We therefore prevent the accident. Our classic example was because of a bad procedure in putting the aircraft down below the altitude of the Empire State Building until somebody does it again. Okay, and we got to watch for that. All right. We, someone talked about perceptions. Uh, we're, we're filled with it through the media, and yes, they have to make a profit, but people like to read. I, I'll give you a couple of perceptions real quick. I came over here on a U.S. Air flight, no problem. We landed over at Logan. We touched down. Uh, we immediately blew a tire. There was a little thump, 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 and vibration. We taxied to the gate, no problem. My wife met me here. She had flown in on a TWA flight, no problem at all. We get in the cab. We're going through the tunnel. Oh, she's nine months pregnant, okay? We're going through the tunnel, and she delivers right there, okay? Twins, but they're Siamese twins. They're attached by their big toes. Now, we rushed. We managed to get to the hospital, close the tunnel off. Coming out of the hospital, I get mugged, and I lose $400, okay? You know what the media is going to report on? The blown tire on the U.S. air jet, right? Okay, you get the picture. My little daughter, Abigail, who is nine, has been to Florida nine straight spring vacations to see Grandma. After watching the carnage up at Detroit, she said, Dad, I am not going to go to Florida next year. Well, it shocked me. A month later, I bought Top Gun, and every night I came home from work, she was watching it. And she says, Dad, I want to be a Navy fighter pilot. Okay? It's a perception. And we've been selling perceptions. It doesn't matter who's selling it. The fact is, we're really doing a little better than what the world is trying to be presented. We are suffering some problems, though. And I don't, you know, Mr. Bond, you're still an administrator. I can still hear you talking. That's good. 
We've got to say the positive things about our system. Absolutely must happen. And Ed Pinto has to defend general aviation. And so does John O'Brien have to defend the pilots. And we have to have the controllers supported. It's too bad the airlines aren't here and the military. Everybody's got a piece of the action, and we all don't want, well, we, none of us want our turf stepped on, okay? I would like to point out to you that in deregulation in 1977, there were some hearings. And uh, in September, and I'll just read a memorandum from Mr. John Burton, chairman of one of the subcommittees. Those of you who attended those hearings in September will remember the insurances we received from Mr. X and Mr. Y concerning the impact of airline deregulation on aviation safety and FAA manpower requirements. Their argument was that there would be no adverse effect on aviation safety and there would be no need for additional flight service station or flight standard service inspector manpower. Well, I have a copy of that memorandum that was circulated or submitted by one of the FAA staff. Because of a shortage of inspectors, there would be deficiencies in maintenance training, maintenance quality and maintenance personnel, abuses of the minimum equipment list, which is the sort of the Bible that the airline decides whether the airplanes are going to fly or not. Uh, the guy who wears two hats, he works for the airline and he represents the administrator in times of financial trouble, will tend to lean toward his company. And the fifth thing was that because of the large number of new airlines starting up, we wouldn't have enough inspectors to go around. And ladies and gentlemen, I think that was a very prophetic document because I think all of those things happened and they, some of them are still happening. We are going to see a change in the minimum equipment list policy. We hope it will no longer be abused. When we see things like Air Illinois in 1983 uh, having a terrible crash and then discovering that they kept two sets of maintenance books, one for themselves and one for the FAA, then I think we've got problems. There are five things that I believe affect safety. Number one, and this is in an uh, adverse or, shall we say, proverse way. First, it is people. The people who touch or separate airplanes, pilots, mechanics, flight attendants, ground handlers, baggage stores, and air traffic controllers. Day in and day out, they do an incredible job. Second thing is politics. Need I say much on that one? The third thing is the outside environment, the air traffic control system, the airports, the runways, and most important, the weather, the microbursts, the wind shears, the thunderstorms, the ice. These are external things that we can't control, but at least we can control their effects. Okay, we haven't yet found a way to control the weather, but as one airline points out, we don't go up in turbulence, we avoid it. Northwest Orient. They have a dozen meteorologists. Some major airlines have none. The fourth thing is money. If you don't have money, you can't be safe. You may for a while because you're going to borrow it, but you've got to pay the bill someday. The fifth thing, and I think the very most important thing, is, in a phrase, the performance and the attitude of management. If you have a management team that says, we're going to give you the tools to be safe, we expect you to be safe, you will tend to behave that way. If your airline management says, eh, do the weight and balance after you get in the air, that's not safe. You don't know what that airplane is going to weigh. You don't know how it's balanced. And yet this has happened time and again. We have a long way to go in aviation safety, in my opinion. I don't look at 365-day statistics. I look at daily statistics. 1985 was a bad year. 86, theoretically, was a good year. But 
what happened at Cerritos, as Ed pointed out, uh, General Aviation got the, got the credit for that one. It was a foreign airline, but it was in the U.S. air traffic control system. 1987, who knows how it's going to end. The last one at Denver, we had uh, two people in the airplane who, uh, two fine people, but didn't have much flying time as a crew in that type of airplane. And I don't blame the crew, I blame Continental Airlines. That's a travesty. It's inexcusable. That brings me to the point about airlines that are in turmoil. How or how to pick your airline. And that's pretty tough on the, the consumer. What has the consumer got to work with? You know, John O'Brien probably knows more about any one airline than anybody in this room or in this community. But he can't say what he really feels, and maybe he wouldn't anyway. But the point is, we have some airlines that are suffering some pretty severe turmoil, either through labor management, through financial problems, pilot-to-pilot uh, -pilot, uh, turmoil. Uh, it's there. All you have to do is read the newspapers and you'll see it. If we're so safe, then I guess the observation that most airlines don't have safety departments would be valid. Okay? Uh, you know, there are only a few airlines that have a safety department. Every military squadron, group, wing, aircraft carrier, air base has safety people. We don't buy it. We don't pay for it. It's almost like it's a seat belt or a fire extinguisher. It costs money. It's useless. But boy, when you need it, you'll pay anything for it. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I could go on and talk for hours. I have already used up most of my last minute. Uh, I'm going to be flying back to Columbus tomorrow. Um, my wife is really home. She's not really pregnant. Uh, we can't afford to have accidents. That's what my wife told me. Um, so I think I'll go back tomorrow on a very safe flight. There'll be a reasonably good air traffic control. I hope the controller hasn't been working his sixth day in a row. I hope the old tube type radio keeps running. I hope the, uh, one of the engines doesn't fall off because of a bad bolt. You know, it goes on and on. But it's still safer than driving it over I-90, one, two, three, whatever. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Thank you to all of our speakers. I, I know uh, some of you may be interested in responding to some of the remarks that would be made, and so let me ask our panelists whether any or all of you might like to respond to uh, some of the themes and, and comments that have been raised. I'll go, Joe. I've been waiting. Ed? Uh, John? Yes, sir. General Aviation didn't get the credit for Cerritos. It was the air traffic control equipment that got the credit, uh, we were a secondary cause. But, but wasn't that, that in your statistical, I mean, your yeah, total body right, count? Right, but, but, the, but the accident. That's what I meant. But, okay, but the accident was caused, uh, according to the NTSB, by air traffic. Because of uh, systems, uh, air traffic systems, uh, not, the, not the individual, not the controller, but the aging equipment, perhaps. There are radar outages, blind spots, especially in the Los Angeles area. There are just places where the radar is not adequately uh, uh, giving returns. Um, I just wanted to get that on the record. As you said, I have to defend general aviation. Anybody else? I'd like to ask our panelists to comment briefly on one, one thing that John O'Brien raised. Uh, and it's related to the question of both the perception and the reality of aviation safety. John O'Brien used the term, the margin of safety. I'd like to hear your thoughts on whether you think that is a meaningful concept, what it means, and is it deteriorating? Anybody? Anybody have any remarks on that? Other than John? Well, John, go ahead. Let, let me restate then what, what we think the margin of safety means. Uh, we really like to 
talk about exposure to risk as far as safety, but and we didn't invent the term margin of safety, but when we think of the margin of safety, we think of the difference between the minimum safety standards that the FAA is charged by the 1958 Aviation Act to establish and the highest level of safety that an airline operator is charged to operate under by the same 1958 Aviation Act. <coughs> and if you look at individual airlines, you see a vast difference between the FAA, the Federal Air Regulations, the FARs, the minimum standards, and the airline's operation specifications, which are the real rules that the airline operates by. There are significant differences. Also, if you would look at those differences in 1978 and then look at those differences today, you will see significant change. The margin has reduced or has shrunk, and it has reduced and shrunk through applications for exemptions, waivers, and deviations to the operation specifications or the basic minimum safety standards. And every one of the requests for these exemptions, waivers, or deviations are based upon financial need. Anybody else? Well, then uh, perhaps our audience has some, some questions. Yes? I'm interested in knowing what information you think the federal government collects about aviation that it could productively release to the public sort of in general what you think the effect of the difficulty of getting information as a traveler about a particular company is. Like if I want to go and get a copy of the Eastern Airlines inspection report, it's a very difficult thing to do and the FAA keeps it under really strict supervision. I mean you can go in there and you can read it but you can't copy it, things like this. Could you explain what information you think you might release to the public so that they could through the market put some pressure on carriers, for instance, who don't comply with safety regulations? Why is it the government's policy that I, as a consumer, can't, for instance, know Airline X doesn't conform and therefore not buy their ticket? And sort of for both of you. Who well, Dom, would you like to go first? Thank you. I think you've probably been misled by someone that you couldn't copy the information. That's not quite true. Uh, I think the new administrator, Mr. Alan McCarter, early in his tenure said that he planned as an objective to make known to the American public the, the very thing that you're talking about. And that uh, in effect becomes a rating scale on the air carriers. The problem is, one of the problems is that we are dealing with so many variables and when I listen to John O'Brien describe the margin of safety, uh, he is speaking in terms of fairly qualitative values, and, and although there may be some distinct quantitative vari values, it's, it's not like being able to go to a, an analysis of a company through Standard & Poor's or Moody's and get some hard numbers and then run a regression line or a multiple regression and then rank that company with other ones. We're dealing with some almost ethereal variables and until somebody spends enough time working on that activity, in which it is being worked on here at uh, the Department of Transportation, Transportation Research Center, uh, when that is completed, it may give us a pretty good idea of who is operating both profitably and probably safely. Well, I can't answer why they have that policy. All I can say is this should be a good topic for uh, some legislative uh, action. Um, let, me, let me try to answer that, if I may, because um, I heard you say the NASA safety reports. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. The NASA runs a program at Lewis Center. NASA. All right. 
I, I am unfamiliar with, with the details of that. There are two categories of information that the FAA does not or cannot re release. One is proprietary information. There's a mess of that that is design specification and so on that is owned by an airline or an aircraft manufacturer, and it really goes to the heart of the safety analysis, I might add. And that just can't be, I mean, the, the FAA is besieged by one aircraft manufacturer who wants to get somebody else's a constant low-grade infection of lawyers' battles trying to pry this stuff out, and it can't be done. Um, I mean, it's fundamental to the safety business that it is given freely to the government and that it can't be yielded up to anybody else. Uh, in lawsuits, of course, it comes out, but otherwise not. The other is, uh, under the Freedom of Information Act, is stuff that is incipient policy development information that hasn't crystallized yet within the FAA and uh, that kind of stuff, plus Privacy Act stuff. I mean, there's a whole series of categories of information that the government can't give out, and it seems to me, unfortunately, very unfortunately, in my opinion, that this list of, of uh, civil rights and proprietary and other kind of stuff is increasing that the government can't give away. I would like to see it all come out, to be quite frank with you. Uh, my experience is that anything that is written on the 10th floor of the FAA, which is where the administrator's office is, is in the hands of the industry within minutes. Technical data may be, however, buried. Uh, I can't give you an answer about the NACIP, that program, because ordinarily I would say it's, it would have thought it was available. Is that John? There's several classifications of data that, that are released by FAA, uh, by other agencies, DOT and, and NASA that uh, Mr. Vaughn referred to, but and there's all kinds of proprietary strings attached to all of this, um, and basically it goes back to uh, financial considerations. So even though John maybe was making a little sarcastic comment about standard and pours and stuff, those kind of classifications, that's probably your best source of information. Uh, we believe there is a direct tie between an airline's safety performance and its financial condition. Good financial condition probably good safety. Poor financial, poor safety. And that assumption that we have made through careful review of the 44 airlines that we are involved with um, is backed up by DOT in a recent decision that uh, was made in response to United Airlines' request not to supply certain information to DOT, and it was financial information, and the DOT rejected their request based on the fact that there is a direct tie or correlation between financial or safe and safety conditions. Given the fairly reassuring comments that most of you have brought forward this evening, I'm wondering why is it that uh, air safety has become a national concern and what does industry or the government plan to do to calm the American public if that's what's all that's necessary? I think we also said we weren't sure why it's a national concern. I said uh, some. Yes. Uh, I can only tell you what my organization would like to do, and I know there are some other efforts along these lines. Uh, it was shortly after, uh, sometime in August, a few, a few events occurred that uh, got us angry. We went out to the membership, and we asked, we solicited for the first time in our history uh, monetary contributions. We, 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 we have already a very low due structure, which doesn't even pay for the services we provide. We make money off of other activities. And we didn't have enough money to go out, and we wanted to engage in a public education and information campaign, not related to the, the substance or the, or the policy issues that we were in favor of, but a general broad-based aviation. We, uh, we collected uh, what really is a, a remarkable amount of money for us, but for, an, for a media campaign in the United States, is merely just a drop in the bucket. It's not going to go very far. Last week, with John's group, we had... Uh, an advertisement in the uh, Wall Street Journal um, s stating where we think some of the problems are and getting, trying to get the airline passengers to support efforts and write to Congress and get some attention that way. That's what we're doing. Other groups are trying to do the same thing, uh, as I understand it, but it's... What I was wondering was what specific things do the public worry about? Crashes in midair, takeoff? I think the public should specifically worry more, more about weather than, any, than anything else period. And, and the public is not because the public's not being told that. Anybody else? Yes. 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 Y
Bond, if you could uh, describe what level of development, what stage of development, and also the schedule of implementation for those two systems. You had mentioned the uh, mid-air collision avoidance and also the wind shear uh, warning. One is of recent origin, and one, it goes back a long way. The, uh, let's start with the recent origin. I mentioned that the wind shear problem uh, was, was not even identified as a scientific phenomenon until 1978 by Dr. Fujita. And after that, we went around and took pictures of it and measured it, and suddenly people began to understand what the phenomenon of the microburst or the downburst is. It basically is a very short-term phenomenon. Frequently, it occurs in clear air. It's not associated in all cases, even with a, with a uh, cloud formation. Um, it's a violent downward flow of air, which, like a column of uh, water or fluid, just comes out like that at the bottom. And an aircraft that is departing through the other side, uh, or you know, passing through the other side, finds that uh, there, there's a violent wind from the tail of the aircraft, which reduces the speed of the air over its wings, destroys lift, and the aircraft loses altitude rapidly. If this were to happen at altitude, the aircraft would simply fall a few hundred feet or a thousand feet or whatever it would be and regain flying speed. But at low altitude, it's deadly. Um, that's wind shear. Uh, we are now in the process of, um, well, we made one step uh, before that, low level detection, which was a process that is pretty well distributed around the U.S. now, around the airports, which is to put a bunch of anemometers around the corners of the airport and then to bring their readings into the tower and tell the controllers uh, what when there's a conflict between the wind directions and velocities. That's a clue to low level wind shear detection. It isn't very good. What we really need is something that will profile the whole thing. And the clue to that is the Doppler uh, weather radar. It's, um, uh, it's a, uh, well, it's a, it's a radar measuring device that, that, that picks up weather, uh, pieces of dust, the fine particles in the air, some moisture, there's always some moisture, it senses it and profiles it and tells a controller about that device. And uh, that is still in the development stage, and my guess is it's mid 1990s. Uh, would you? Is that somewhere right, John? What would you think? Originally planned to be installed in 90 and up around 97. Now. Yeah, yeah. I, it's a it's it's a new device, and it's uh, it has a gestation period. The mid-air collision side of it, uh, it, it's wrong to overemphasize the seriousness of this. All I mean, every crash is serious, but there have. The uh, Dallas crash with the Delta Lockheed 1011 was a wind shear phenomenon. The Pan American crash on departure this t that time at New Orleans was also a wind shear phenomenon. Those are the two most recent ones. Over the last decade, I'd guess that makes two. Um, now, the mid-air collision uh, problem goes way back. People have been trying to design a, an onboard box that will talk to boxes in other aircraft uh, for a long time. From my personal point of view, it is ter ter my belief it is the most difficult technical problem and regulatory combined and political and user price practical problem that I have ever seen associated with civil aviation. It is absolutely Byzantine in its complexity, and many approaches, time after time, have been e explored, and it turned out to be no good. Rejected by the users, don't work very well, price is not right, uh, payoffs are not good. Finally. Uh, it looks like the TCAS system is going to be good. P Piedmont Airlines has uh, just made the decision, God bless them, to be the first to buy and install the aircraft. Uh, I would guess, I would say, therefore, that implementation for them is 18 or months or so away, maybe uh, something like that. And other users will pick it up, and I would say in five to seven years it will be universal. Just a quick comment, uh, more specific, I think, to your question. The, the systems for detection, avoidance, uh, will be installed at, at 100 airports, or plan to be installed at 100 airports. The original plan was within three years, 1990. There's been some technical evolution problems. Uh, it's a spinoff from a, a National Weather Service radar that's being installed to replace all the existing civilian um, warning system radars for tornadoes and hurricanes and whatnot. A spinoff from that system will be installed at 100 airports. The problem with that is that there are many more than 100 airports around this country, and so what do you do at the other airports? So we have insisted, the pilots have insisted, that an equal effort be developed to install, develop and install a device on all air carrier airplanes, so airplanes going into other than those 100 airports and airports all around the world as well uh, will also have the same level of protection. NASA is working on such a system. It's being test flown now. It's probably around three to five years away from development. On the collision avoidance system, just following up what uh, Langhorne said, the 
we have been working for years on such a system. It's very promising now. The United Airlines is flying a system similar to what uh, Piedmont has announced they're going to buy. Both of these systems are, are extremely promising. We as pilots are very encouraged by the, the results of the testing to date. And if everything goes the way it's planned now, there will be a rule uh, come out early next year requiring all air carrier planes to have uh, TCAS equipment installed within three years. And it's technically feasible. It's just a matter of making the decision, going ahead and doing it now. I think that there's a lesson to be, to be learned from this conversation in your question, and that is that the future is optimistic for air safety, and that the march of progress towards defining problems and solving them is inexorable in this business. And I can tell you that in 10 years or 12 years from now, some relatively small slice of time, five years, whatever it might be, this problem will, for all practical purposes, be reduced to almost nothing. Well, one last comment on all of that. Uh, it is good, and I support those last comments you just heard, but sometimes it is terribly frustrating. And again, we get back to resources and money. We could have had TCAS, a collision avoidance system, years ago, except if you look back at what FAA does and how they allocate priorities and the resources provided to them, you have a collision of you have a linear collision, San Diego. N number one priority was collision avoidance systems. But then you have an, another accident, Air Canada at Cincinnati, it's cabin interiors, flammability. So then the number one priority is, is cabin interiors and, and toxicity of materials and, and seat strengths. And so the collision avoidance system, the, there's funds taken away from it, it's priority changes, and so therefore the people working on it are frustrated and the development almost grinds to a halt. Then a wind shear accident comes along. And so all of a sudden the, the focus is wind shear and, and the cabin interior material program takes a lower because the, if you look at research and development funding levels over the past 10 years, it stayed fairly constant except for the new radars in the National Airspace System Plan. But the other development monies are the are same. So when the Congress acts and becomes interested in something, when public acts and becomes interested because of media attention, priorities change, and a program takes forever to get accomplished. Legitimate criticism. I think we're going to have to stop now. I apologize. I know we have some more questions. But uh, the building um, uh, empties itself. Uh, uh, before we do, I'd like to thank all of our speakers for, for your time and your thoughts. And I know the audience enjoyed it. So thank you very much.